public and we're letting people in yeah we're going to let everyone in right now admit all good because andrew kelly's been texting me <laughs> <laughs> don't let right. him in <laughs> production takes a while i know i give you a grief <laughs> All right, that's everyone is in. We're ready to go. Okay. Um, I don't, uh, is Lisa Caldwell in yet or is we're just going to add her when she comes? I'll add her when she comes. Oh, there she is. I see her. She's here. Oh, good. She made okay. Um, so welcome everybody uh, to Tuesday, December 15th, uh, Portsmouth School Committee meeting. It's all virtual tonight. Um uh, and will you please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance and a moment of silence for our troops in harm's way and the PSD um, Zoom window is the flag. So. Mm -hmm. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, United States, States of America and to, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay, we had a uh, we had an executive session uh, prior to this meeting. Uh, no votes were taken. May I have a motion, please, to seal the executive session minutes? So moved. Second. And uh, because we're on Zoom, we have to do a, a roll call vote. Uh, Mr. Farber? Aye. Mr. Payero? Aye. Mr. Vadney? Here. Aye. Right, well, I'm It's a roll call, right? No, it's um, uh, sealing the minutes. Yeah. Oh, okay, aye. Gotcha. Karen McDade? Aye. Mr. Shears? Aye. Uh, Ms. Kelly? You have to unmute yourself. Can't yeah. unmute herself, okay? I think I can unmute you. Or maybe I can. All right, there we go. It said the host wouldn't let me unmute myself. Hi. Hi, <laughs> good. We're, we're going to let you speak this time. And, uh, I got everybody and Emily Copeland, I. Okay, unanimous uh, seven zero, we're at full strength. Um, please let the record reflect that we are all uh, present. And um, I have on here the, the RIASC uh, meeting update. This is the chair's meeting. Um, they did a, um, a presentation from RIDE on the Rhode Island Education Accountability Act, uh, site-based management. I did send that um, uh, PowerPoint to all of you, and I think for us, you know, a lot of this we we've, we've heard about before in terms of what the the law entails and the school improvement teams. But um, they do have a slide specifically. I think it's slide eight, um, which talks about the school committee's responsibilities and um, you know, the uh, need to establish uh, and review uh, certain policies regarding school improvement teams. And, um, uh, and, uh, and so there was some uh, discussion about that. There was discussion about, um, was there going to be additional training? Um, and they're also going back to um, the legislature this coming session in January to um, fill out some of the, or, you know, to elaborate, let's put it that way, on um, some more of the responsibilities. So um, the full implementation of this is supposed to be in fall 2022. Um, but um, obviously in, in February 2021 is when they're hoping to release some more guidance on this. Spring 2021, um, they're talking about training modules 
And, um, you know, it was really just an update on um, kind of the next steps and uh, what to expect. But obviously, I think for the, um, the school committee here, it's uh, mainly uh, going to fall on the policy subcommittee's lap to make sure our policies are in line with um, the new legislation. But you should have all had um, that uh, PowerPoint. And Isabel, I will make sure I send that um, to you as well. As well. Thank you. Um, so I'd, I'd just like to um, uh, report back that uh, we've had three um, individuals from the school committee uh, sworn in for four-year terms and one individual sworn in for two-year terms by the town council uh, week, uh, last Monday, I believe, December 7th. So Congratulations to Karen McDade, um, Juan Carlos Payero, Isabel Kelly, and myself uh, for um, being sworn in for our, another term. So um, it was a very, very nice ceremony. I mean, I think only in Rhode Island do you get a senator, a, uh, let's see, we had the Secretary of State, we had the Attorney General, um, what else, who else we have, the Treasurer. Yeah, I mean, you know, for little old Portsmouth. So, um, like I said, only in Rhode Island, right? Um, but most importantly here, we also want to welcome our new school committee member, uh, Isabel Kelly. Uh, she was um, nominated and voted in by the town council to, to fill the vacancy left when uh, Ms. Holtman resigned uh, her term in the midst of it. So um, welcome to the school committee and we look, we all look forward to uh, working with you. I, I know you've had a, a chance to meet with Dr. Kenworthy and um, our lawyer, Attorney Carroll. And uh, I know I've had a couple of conversations with you, but would you like to say a, a few words? Well, I'm, I'm mostly, I'm just, um, uh, you know, I'm happy to have been appointed and I'm, I'm really looking forward to kind of filling things out and seeing where I can be mo of most use and, and helpful and, and just working with everybody as a team. Great, great. Well, welcome. Um, don't, now Thank now you. that you're actually on the committee, we can tell you it is a little bit more than two meetings <laughs> a month, but, um, but I think you'll enjoy it. It's, it's very, very rewarding, uh, rewarding work. Okay, now because of the election, uh, we now have to have our organizational meeting uh, by policy. Um, and um, this is at the first regular meeting after the elections and the swearing in and qualifications of um, the, the new members, which in, for the most part are our old members. Um, and uh, so the first order of business reading from our policy here is that the highest ranking officer from the preceding school committee shall be temporary chair for the first meeting of the new committee until a permanent chair is selected. So I believe that's me. So I'm going to be temporary chair. And um, the, the first item on the agenda is the election of a chair. And I have to call for nominations three times per policy. So uh, are there any nominations? I nominate Emily Copeland for chair. I'll, I'll second, second that. Thank you. Uh, are there any nominations? Hearing none. Are there any other nominations? Hearing none. Okay. So we have um, one uh, nomination, Emily Copeland. Um, and um, um, so we shall now vote on that nomination. Mr. Ferber? Aye. Mr. Payero? Aye. Mr. Vadney? Aye. Mr. Shears? Aye. Ms. McDade? Aye. Ms. Kelly? Aye. Emily Copeland? Aye. Unanimous 7-0. Thank you all very much. I, I look forward to continuing to do this for a couple of more years and or until I'm kicked off, right? <laughs> so um, now moving on to the election of uh, vice chair. Do I hear any nominations for vice chair? I, I, I nominate one Carlos Payero, who goes by Carlos. Second. Okay. Second. So we have a nomination and a second. 
Uh, I don't think we actually need seconds for nominations, but that's okay. Um, uh, are there any other nominations? Are there any other nominations? Are there any other nominations? Hearing not, we will now vote on the nomination of Juan Carlos Payero for vice chair. Mr. Ferber? Aye. Mr. Payero? Okay. Mr. Vadney? Aye. Um, Mr. Shears? Aye. Ms. McDay? Aye. Ms. Kelly? Aye. Emily Copeland, I, unanimous, 7-0. Congratulations, Carlos. Um, I think we would be remiss to take a moment with that, uh, to uh, not take a moment here and say thank you very much to Fred Ferber, who has uh, fulfilled that role very, very well uh, over the last two years. Fred, do you want to say anything? Not really. Okay. Well, thank <laughs> you. We appreciate it. <laughs> I know, brevity. <laughs> Okay. Good luck, Carlos. <laughs> Sorry? I say good luck, Carlos. Oh. Thank you, Fred. <laughs> um, and now, uh, this is one of the new changes based on the Charter Review Committee. We're, go we we're going to have a formal election of the um, town clerk. I mean, not town clerk, sorry. Uh, the school committee uh, clerk. Um, do I have any nominations? Uh, I nominate uh, Tom Vadney. Okay. Uh, I'll second. I, thank you. I'm not sure if we have to have a second, but we'll do that just yeah. in case. Yeah. Um, are there any other nominations? Are there any other nominations? Are there any other nominations? Okay. Hearing no other nominations, we'll call the vote. Mr. Ferber? Aye. Mr. Payero? Aye. Mr. Vadney? Aye. Mr. Shea? <coughs> Aye. Ms. McDade? Aye. Ms. Kelly? Aye. Emily Copeland? Aye. Unanimous, 7-0. Congratulations, Tom. OK. Um, the next thing we have to do is establish our meeting dates and time. Um, we have um, uh, set out a school uh, committee meeting calendar for the second and fourth Tuesdays for the most part, uh, with some exceptions given holidays, et cetera, et cetera. Um, can I have a move to adopt the calendar as um, scheduled for the remainder of the academic year? So moved. Second. Okay. Any discussion? Hearing no discussion, call the vote. Uh, Mr. Farber? Aye. Mr. Payero? Aye. Mr. Vadney? Aye. Mr. Shears? Aye. Ms. McDade? Aye. Ms. Kelly? Aye. Emily Copeland? Uh, uh, unanimous. I don't know if you guys can hear this, but I have puppies like growling and barking and yipping in the background here. We adopted two puppies from the Potter League, so it's a little, uh, come on, go on next, go, 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 thank you. Um, okay, um, we will need at our next meeting, um, the, the remaining two things we have to do per our policy is um, on or before our third regular meeting, adopt the bylaws, appoint legal counsel, and uh, appoint uh, subcommittees. So we will do all of those at our next um, at our next meeting. All right, uh, moving on to the regular agenda. Time for a subcommittee updates. Uh, racial equity, Mr. Payero. All right, so I will do racial equity, and Emily, if it's okay with you, I'll just jump in and do health and wellness immediately after. Uh, they're item one and two anyway. Uh, racial equity. We had our our most recent meeting was on, sorry, I'm looking at my calendar just to make sure I give the right date, um, was on December 3rd. Yes, December 3rd at 3.30 via Zoom. Uh, that one was actually our most abbreviated meeting where we uh, discussed a debrief of the staff development and the PD that happened and on the uh, distance learning day. Uh, this coming Thursday is our next meeting, December 17th at 3.30, also via Zoom. And the main focus 
of this meeting or the largest uh, agenda item is our mission, vision, and formalizing objectives and document that we will be introducing to the entire committee. As always, member of the community are welcome to join and, and play, uh, play a part in sharing this type of work across the district. Uh, as for health and wellness, and uh, we had our, well, we had two meetings in the last week, uh, one because, uh, it was most because of a, uh, an omission in the initial agenda, uh, but we had our first meeting in, uh, last day and then had a meeting actually this afternoon to continue the work of that. Uh, we actually went ahead and uh, voted for recommendation an updated version of the health and wellness policy, uh, which would be going to the policy subcommittee for their review. Uh, the vote was unanimous. Uh, and the next meeting is actually not until March 18th at 4 p.m. Uh, information for that meeting uh, has gone out to the representatives. Uh, whether or not it's going to be in person or Zoom is a bit, yeah, be, between God and Gina. <laughs> and that's my report. Thank you very much. Uh, safety committee, Ms. Shears. Okay. Uh, the safety committee met on December 10th. Uh, the safety committee is made up of 15 representatives of the school system and first responders and other members of the community. Uh, we cannot get into specifics in the committee uh, as far as the actions, but it's to say that we look at uh, all issues uh, related in this area, uh, such as the equipment, such as uh, the times and, and various other aspects that are, are, are warranted. Uh, we meet on a uh, quarterly basis and at other times that are needed. So we had our meeting and it was uh, very productive and uh, Rest assured that uh, we all have the safety of the students in mind and also teachers and administration. Okay. Great, I'm gonna ask you to continue on please with capital subcommittee. Okay, we had a capital planning subcommittee committee meeting today uh, and uh, we had six, six members uh, there. Uh, we unanimously passed uh, an issue as far as uh, spending a, uh, a certain amount that we're gonna be recommending uh, later in the meeting uh, for some work in the administration uh, building. It's, it's, a, it's a smaller amount. So uh, we meet at uh, varied times uh, looking at uh, the expenditures and we try to get uh, a dollar fifties worth out of each dollar spent. Thank you. Just to clarify, you don't have six school committee members on that. No, you excuse me. I'm, voting members. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry if uh, that was confusing. Yes, there's six voting members. Uh, we three, have three. Well, no, we have three voting members that are uh, representatives of the school committee. And then there were three other uh, mm -hmm. members of the administration that uh, and, and staff that were uh, in attendance. Great, thank Sorry. you. Sorry. No, that's okay. Just wanted to make sure we did, because six members would be a quorum and that would be a whole different thing. <laughs> well, we, 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 we had an adequate bunch. Good. <laughs> All right, um, thank you very much. Is there any uh, public comments? Uh, no chat. No. To uh, raise their hands. Oh, I'm just taking a moment here. Nothing in chat. Not seeing any hands raised. Okay, we'll assume there is no public comments. Um, moving on to our PHS liaisons communication. And I see uh, Iceland and Raiden both here. So I don't know. Can we? Uh, we'll get both of you guys Raiden's good. there. And who would Hi. like to start? Hi. I can start. Um, so for the holiday season, we have decided to try and promote a dress up day in the high school. So we're asking kids to wear either um, 
pajamas, uh, like holiday pajamas or ugly sweaters on Thursday and Friday, even if they are virtual, um, just to kind of promote holiday spirit and get everyone a little happy during times that are so happy. Okay. And after the holiday season in January, we're having another blood drive. So our last blood drive, we had about 30 participants. So we're trying to increase that for this upcoming one, which is going to be on the 26th at St. John's Lodge after school, which is the same hours that we had for the last one. But we're hoping by doing it towards the middle of the week that any teachers who would have been teaching from home previously on the Monday would be in school. So they would be there to go right after school to St. John's, which is right across the street, if anyone is interested in donating. And what, what is the date of that again? January 26th. Okay. That's really awesome because I know they've been showing that the blood banks are in short supply and it's great to do that. Yeah. And then that's all we have for tonight. If you guys don't have any questions. Any questions? Well, we'll be having the high school program of studies here in a moment. So we may have a bunch of questions then too. So, okay. Thank you ladies very much. Appreciate it. Uh, moving on to the superintendent's update, Dr. Kenworthy. Thank you, Dr. Copeland. Good evening, everyone. Uh, first up on my agenda is a personnel update, uh, just updating the committee on any personnel changes we've made since the last uh, full meeting. Um, so we did have one resignation of an RBT paraprofessional, Julie Feister at Portsmouth Middle School, and um, that we did know about that resignation. So we were able to advertise and fill the position for the remainder of the year. Um, and we were able to welcome uh, Ian Krisiak, um, who took over in that position. Um, I also wanted to mention, although this is not technically a Portsmouth um, School Department employee, our uh, Portsmouth High School Student Assistance Counselor which I, I believe everyone on the committee is familiar with, with that position we've had it a number of years. Um, we contract with an agency um, for that service, but that, that person typically remains for, you know, our, our last few have remained for a number of years and become you know, really embedded as part of the community there. But uh, Terry Gregg, who had been serving in that position for the last few years, did take another position within the agency. So uh, we welcomed Kayla Tassano um, so she just recently took over and I know is starting to uh, you know, make herself known to the, to the students and staff there, but comes very highly recommended. Uh, next up for me is uh, I wanted to update. Um, we heard a number of updates on official uh, school committee uh, subcommittees. We also have a couple of other committees that have a meeting regularly. They're not officially uh, subcommittees of the school committee. Uh, but they, um, you know, they they meet on an ad hoc basis and support uh, some important work we have going on. We do have school committee representation. So the first is our building committee, um, and this is a group uh, that has been meeting quite a bit the last few years. Um, uh, this helps. Uh, this group helps in the initial stages of our uh, stage two um, proposal for our our, our uh, capital improvement plan. And so uh, everyone knows last year. Um, we had culminated with, with a really big plan we were trying to put together, but did have to pull back uh, because of um, some unforeseen developments, including COVID that happened. So uh, in the fall, this committee had started meeting again because we do have to get a, a capital plan moving forward. So um, the group met again on November 19th. Um, it includes representatives among uh, you know, various stakeholders within the Portsmouth School Department, town representatives, uh, Dr. Copeland and Mr. Shares are in this um, ad hoc committee as well. Uh, at this most recent meeting, we were joined by representatives uh, from Colliers, who the school committee approved a few meetings ago as our owner's project management firm that will help in the development of, of our stage two application and Studio Jade. They're the architectural firm that helped develop our previous stage two proposal. Uh, so they still have a, a, um, you know, a lot of the good background knowledge there on, on what um, the aspects of that plan were. At the last building committee meeting, this group agreed that uh, we would um, be 
be uh, designing a revised condensed stage two proposal that would focus on health and safety items, but still include projects at all four of our schools. Um, and so we have, we actually have another meeting set for tomorrow in which the committee is, will be finalizing that list of projects. Once that list of projects is finalized, it will come back before the full school committee and then the town council. Again, those, those are required steps um, uh, for approval in the stage two development process. Uh, the other ad hoc committee that I wanted to update on was one that we just re we started this year, and that was is a transportation committee. So this group met on December 1st. The committee, again, includes various representatives from the school department. Um, we have a, a few parents also helping us out in this committee, and Mr. Vadney is a school, school committee representative. Um, so our transportation contract is due for bid uh, again this year, uh, and it's been... A number of years since we've made any substantive changes to um, that contract or transportation services it's just kind of been rolling over um, uh, the last few times that, that contract was up uh, so this group agreed that uh, there should be three main goals of for our next transportation contract and first and foremost to improve the age of our busing fleet um, secondly to reduce the overall number of buses where possible obviously with you know, in, in order to still be able to meet um, the demand that we would need to and do it in a safe manner. Uh, but if there's any way possible to reduce the number of buses on the road uh, for Portsmouth, and then also with that increase overall efficiency, particularly with drop off times at the high school and the middle school in the morning. And um, that's where we have been, been um, uh, having some difficulty. Um, so with that, that's going to be to uh, an agenda item that you'll see later in the business agenda where I'm, I'm going to be asking uh, for your review and approval um, to hire a, a transportation routing consultant because all of those goals um, really can't be achieved unless we take a you know good hard look at our, our transportation routes and that does require uh, some expertise so we're going to talk about that more in the um, business agenda. Mr. Ferber, I know had his hands up, Dr. Copeland, if that's- Yeah, okay. I just have a question on the um, age of our busing fleet. My understanding is our contract requires that none of the buses be older than 10 years. So I'm assuming that some of them are, and how did that happen? Yeah, so I, I, I think you're right on both counts. Uh, Mr. Diorio, I'm probably gonna have to look to you here because you have more of the history on, on that, but I do know that, that has, those things have been part of conversations I've been part of. You're, you're muted, though, Mr. Diorio. Oh, there you go. Sorry there about that. Um, so um, before this year, the answer to that question was no. None of our buses were older than 10. We, we make sure that we get an asset listing and track that. Um, but most of our buses uh, were 10. So they were at the, at the end of the year. Um, this year, however, because our contract expired last June and we did a one year rollover, part of that agreement was that that was with the existing fleet. So we do have buses this year that are older than 10. They're, they could be 11 years old, uh, but that this is the first year that that has happened. And that was specifically called out in the in the rollover contract. Thanks. And so we just we definitely want to make sure that in this new contract going forward that we, we rectify that. Okay, um, so the next up for me, um, just under general district updates, I was going to just spend the time this evening uh, for that item to just reiterate, um, uh, you know, what had been some impending, uh, you know, uh, anticipation for the last few weeks. We've seen other districts uh, making the decision with the upcoming holiday break and the surge in cases throughout our state, although, um, our, our case count has been, you know, uh, relatively manageable within the district. Uh, we are every week seeing, you know, two, three, sometimes four or five new, new cases. Uh, so again, we are, we are managing that within the protocols that we have. Um, but, uh, you know, undoubtedly we are seeing uh, most other communities in the state experience a significant increase. And so I did make a decision last week and announced that starting on December 21st, uh, which will be next Monday through January 8th. So 
a total of three full calendar weeks, but eight school days within that calendar. Due to the holiday break, we are going to take uh, our own version of a pause here in Portsmouth and go to uh, full distance learning. Um, so again, I had I had waited till the end of last week um, to see if anything was going to going to come out um, on, on the state level, and it hadn't. And I just felt like, in my mind, last Friday was a was a good deadline because to make a final decision because then it was going to give this week for both staff and families to make preparations. Uh, yesterday afternoon, uh, the, the 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 state through the Department of Education did come out with um, a strong recommendation for all districts to um, go on full distance learning as of the 21st, which we had decided through um, at least January 6th. So that would be the Wednesday of that week. We had, we've already decided we're gonna stay out through Friday. Um, the ride recommendation now is that districts uh, stay out through at least the 6th. So starting on the 6th, districts can start to bring students back. Um, the recommendation is to do so on a staggered basis. So for us, we will just keep with the uh, decision uh, that's been made. And uh, again, we're, we're fully intending that uh, Monday, January 11th, we will return to our current level of operation within our schools, which is um, uh, full in-person learning every day for grades pre-K through six and our hybrid schedule for grades seven through 12. Kind of related to that topic, I did want to um, just reinforce also the last few uh, district updates. I've been sending out our emergency or weather uh, protocol. Um, if school has to be uh, canceled um, or any decision needs to be made there at any point, we kind of work all of that into the protocol, but it does look like Thursday. Uh, we may see our, our first uh, um, you know, use of that revised protocol. And so part of that protocol now is that this year, uh, districts do have the ability to go to full distance learning. So in lieu of calling um, just a complete snow day, which we, which, you know, everybody, you know, would, would maybe love the day off in one sense. Uh, the, you know, the flip side of that is we do have to make those days up at the end of the calendar. Um, so this year we have the ability to just call a distance learning day uh, we'll try to do so if we have to with as much advance notice, again, to um, make sure everyone is prepared for that. Uh, and the benefit of doing that is that we do not have to make that day up at the end of the year. And so I think, um, again, uh, like most districts, we're going to see how that process goes this year and then you know, be able to make a comparison to um, kind of the traditional snow day that, that we would have typically called. Okay. Uh, next item for me was uh, just an update as Dr. Copeland and I were putting this agenda together and you know, we reflected on this, you know, this, this would be the time of year and typically at this school committee meeting, we would highlight a lot of, um, you know, what, what had been traditional holiday celebrations, you know, most of those being in-person events and concerts and things, but we do have a number of things happening uh, with, within our schools. So I wanted to put together a comprehensive list, uh, uh, the committee, you have that in your full backup. I'm not gonna read through all of those items, but um, again, we, we do wanna, uh, you know, to, to just make it known that all of our schools, um, you know, we are trying to, uh, you know, kind of keep that holiday spirit going as much as possible with, with our students, even through these current times that we're in. So um, I know at uh, Melville, I'll just highlight one of the things from, from each of the schools at Melville. Um, Mr. Ruda, who's the music teacher there, if you um, w were to walk the halls of Melville in the morning, um, and I know um, we have very limited um, visitors to our schools these days, but Mr. Ruda is the music teacher at Melville and he is always out in the hallways on, on any day. Um, he has his little keyboard set up playing music. And so now for the holidays, he's out there um, you know, dressed festively and playing the holiday music um, in addition to other things happening at Melville. Uh, at Hathaway, again, a, a lot of different things that, that they're doing uh, with their students there. But, you know, one of the things in, in uh, we have a lot of STEAM focus uh, in our district. So there is a STEAM activity for the month um, that involves making snow. Um, hopefully, uh, hopefully we'll be able to check that out before uh, uh, the end of the week here. Um, at Portsmouth Middle School, we did see um, a, a lot of advertisement about the winter wonderland that they had this past weekend. So I know that the PTO there was instrumental, did a great job putting that together. 
A lot of things happening as well. We heard from our student representative at Portsmouth High School, and there is a virtual uh, uh, concert that Mr. Rausch is putting together. So that will be, um, that link will be ready to go uh, by next week. And also uh, in our administration building, our staff there uh, always does uh, you know, things to celebrate the holidays. Um, and one of the big things that we do each year is participate in an adoptive family. Um, that's also a common thing at, at, at all of our schools. And just within the administration building from the staff there, we were able to raise uh, a little over $700 to support a local family through the holidays. So again, we just wanted to um, take the opportunity uh, to highlight that, that you know, there, there are many things happening within our schools to uh, in district to celebrate the holidays, just uh, not in the traditional format that we would normally see this time of year. All right, so last thing for me was I wanted to take the opportunity since we are completely uh, through our fall season now, and I know there have been a lot of questions on our winter athletic season and, um, you know, that as we've been uh, in our latest state pause, that winter athletic season keeps getting pushed as well. But I did ask Mr. Tresvan, our athletic director, to, to be on this evening um, to, to give a, a, a good comprehensive recap so I don't miss anything of our fall athletic season and uh, anything that he knows with the latest information for our winter season. So, Mr. Tresvant. Sure thing. Thank you, Dr. Kenworthy. Good evening, everyone. Uh, this past fall, the state of Rhode Island approved a number of uh, low and moderate risk sports uh, that our students had the opportunity to participate in. They included uh, boys and girls cross country, boys and girls soccer, girls tennis, and sideline cheer. We had almost 200 uh, student athletes participate in the fall, which began approximately September 21st and stretched to uh, just about mid-November is when we wrapped up our fall sports season. Uh, much thanks goes out to our coaches, the PHS staff, the game workers, our officials, PHC maintenance department, and our athletic trainer, Jake Towers, uh, who helped keep our student athletes safe during the, this pandemic. In terms of the pandemic, uh, like I said, we, the, the best news that we had from the Interscholastic League was out of the 5,000 plus student athletes that participated in sports, uh, there were only 20 plus uh, confirmed cases of COVID. So that was some phenomenal news that we got from their end. And in addition, we learned that through contact tracing, none of these transmission of positive cases occurred at a practice or at a game. Some of the highlights of our season, our girls tennis team went undefeated in the regular season, progressing all the way to the semifinals in Division II. Our boys soccer captured the number one seed going into the playoffs and uh, lost in a very tough game in penalty kicks uh, to a very, very good Tolman team. And our boys and girls cross country teams both progress to the state championship qualified for that meet this year. Uh, our girls finished in seventh and our boys finished in 11th place. So very proud for their efforts, very proud for everybody working hard in terms of, of keeping up the safety protocols through the fall. And uh, I, was, I was immensely proud of that and how everybody stepped up. Uh, and I, again, I can't thank people enough for the hard work that they did. Uh, our coaches staying late, sanitizing soccer balls, sanitizing and our maintenance department coming in every night, sanitizing the bathrooms. Uh, keeping people socially distanced. Uh, again, a, a tremendous amount of thank yous have to go out to everyone that worked tremendously hard to make that happen. Uh, in terms of the winter, like Dr. Kenworthy did mention, uh, we've had a number of pushback. We were supposed to start on November 30th. That got pushed back to December 14th. And now that date is to be determined. Uh, right now we are looking at, at some point in January, there's still a hope for a season. Uh, the uh, Interscholastic League is waiting for the latest updates from the Rhode Island DEM on youth sport guidance to craft that new date. Uh, that is going to impact crowd size and in, inside spaces, as well as impact facilities uh, in terms of where we have to go. I mean, the winter is reliant upon our swim uses Roger Williams, our boys and girls ice hockey use the Abbey and our gymnastic team uses the Newport YMCA, all of which have their own restrictions all of which will have their own safety protocols in place. Uh, so we have to see where, how that's gonna fit in and how that's going to work uh, moving forward. So the sports that initially have been approved have been for the winter season are basketball, ice hockey, gymnastics, indoor track, and swimming. 
wrestling and competitive cheer have moved to other seasons. They were deemed more high risk uh, due to the amount of contact in those sports. So they've moved to later in the year where hopefully they can happen. The Interscholastic League still has the intention of trying to run every single sport this season. Um, as we move forward and we get that information from the state, we will certainly sit down as an administration at the high school, middle school levels uh, with our upper admin and try to craft what's best here for Portsmouth uh, and how to move forward with hopefully a winter season. I know our student athletes are holding out hope uh, to make this happen, uh, as well as our coaches. So in light of that, uh, we have open registration for winter sports. Um, we are encouraging students to register for the sports, do their paperwork, find physicals, which are a challenge right now. Athletic, you know, get a pre-participation physical from a doctor's because our, our medical community is full out dealing with COVID. Uh, many physicals have been pushed back. So we have found facilities that can do walk-ins uh, that we will provide lists to, to parents. Um, we'll, we'll put that in a Blackboard Connect message so those people can have access to that so they can get all that paperwork. So when we are given that date and we deem it okay and safe for our students to participate, we can move forward with the winter season. Uh, right now we have online our safety protocols for student athletes. It was devised by the Sports Medicine Committee um, on athletics. Uh, that document is now online. Anyone that wants to view it, it's on the athletic page. The, we, we are working hard and trying to make this as safe as possible uh, moving forward. An example of a safety protocol that we're putting in place for the winter would be if anyone that tests positive for COVID needs to be cleared for a doctor prior to their return to sports. Uh, what we found on the collegiate level where there were some underlying uh, medical con conditions for students returning in, on the college level. So in order to find those individuals, you have to send them to a doctor first prior to returning to athletics. So there's, there's many more that I'm not going to go into depth here and the little time that I have, but just know that that document we have put online, anyone that wants to review it can certainly go ahead and review it on our athletic page. Um, the last thing mentioned by the Interscholastic League was certainly trying to get sports up and running for the mental health of our students, you know, trying to give them that connection to school. And, uh, you know, we, everybody's working hard to uh, make that happen. And as soon as we know it's safe and we deem it safe to do so, uh, I know we're all looking forward to doing that. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Trezvan. So that concludes uh, my updates there, unless there are any other questions from the um, I, I Does anybody have a question? I have a question. Um, I was uh, encouraged to hear you say middle school there, because in the in the fall there were no middle school sports. Does that mean there will be middle school sports in the in the winter? Yes, the uh, the it's called RIPCOA, the middle school organization that runs sports, has their intention of doing sports. Uh, they're moving, juggling. They're trying to get all the sports that they would normally have in the year and trying to condense it down to like the second half of the year. Um, so right now they're looking up beginning January uh, to beginning um, winter sports for boys and girls basketball, and they're moving into the traditional fall in late February, March, uh, depending on weather, depending on many things. But uh, their, their intention is to try to have sports as well. Great. I, I think that'll be a welcome addition to the middle school. Other questions for Dr. Kenworthy, Mr. Tresvant? Okay, so uh, seeing none, thank you so much for that update. I'm sure we'll be coming back to the uh, transportation issues here in, um, in just a minute. Um, can I have a motion, please, for the approval of school committee minutes? So moved. Second. Um, I should probably have said uh, November 17th, uh, regular and executive session. Still so moved. Okay. Still, still a second. Good. Uh, all in favor, or no, sorry, I have to do a roll call vote. Uh, Mr. Ferber. Aye. Mr. Payero. Aye. Mr. Vadney. Aye. Mr. Shears. Aye. Ms. McDade. Aye. Ms. Kelly. Aren't I, I, I'm, I can't vote on this, right? Because I wasn't there. You needed to abstain. Good. That was a test. Thank you. Yeah, you passed the test. Well done. <laughs> um, uh, Ms. Copeland. Aye. Uh, so um, six zero uh, affirmative and one abstention. Okay. Uh, can I have a motion for the consent agenda, please? So moved. Second. Um, uh, Mr. Ferber. Aye. Mr. Carpaero. Aye. Mr. Vadney. Aye. Mr. Shears. Aye. Ms. P Ms. McDade. Aye. 
Ms. Kelly? Aye. Ms. Copeland? Aye. Unanimous 7 0. Uh, moving on to the uh, business agenda item A, please. Can I have a motion? I move for discussion and action on the Portsmouth High School Program of Studies. Second. Okay. Um, Dr. Kenworthy, who do you want you. to do sure. the presentation here? Sure. So uh, you notice we did not have a teaching and learning update on this agenda um, because uh, this is typically the time of year we bring forward the high school program of studies and the administrative team there has worked with their leadership team at the high school to put together a, a presentation. You have you have the full uh, draft of the program of studies in your backup, but tonight we're just we're going to be seeing the, the presentation that kind of elaborates on um, you know, some of the, the key changes that are part of that. Um, so this is also technically taking the place of our teaching and learning presentation this evening. So uh, Mr. Costa, we're gonna turn things over to uh, Mr. Amaral and Mrs. Carwin Clair and whoever else that they uh, need unmuted for the presentation. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kenworthy. I wanna thank everyone for their, uh, their, their um, support in the past years for our program of studies and as we continue to develop our, our program this year. We started off with our, each department working with their teachers, uh, looking at the standards in the department, looking at uh, the current offerings for students, what interests students, what doesn't interest students, uh, and then coming forward with ideas and presentation uh, that either modified or refined program uh, classes or courses that are being offered uh, to support our goal, which is to always prepare students for college and career. And um, there's always a lot of exciting and opportune, opportune uh, moments. We are constantly uh, changing over the last four years that I've been at the high school. We've been seeing a lot of changes, and that's in due in part to the great ideas that uh, the school community has to try to motivate uh, strong learning opportunities. Uh, and we've uh, grown, as you know, from the last couple of meetings, you know, we've grown our CTE programs to provide pro, uh, really in-depth learning. We're continuing to develop pathways in certain departments. And we not only are doing some of the work that we're doing for this year to modify our program of studies, but we're also uh, putting together a trajectory for the next two to three years, where we're going to introduce specific new pathways and particular areas such as business and uh, microbiology and other um, uh, such areas that are going to really prepare students for a career and college. And that's been part of our focus. It's part of our strategic plan for the district. And uh, I want to thank all the department chairs for their work uh, and for their collaboration. I want to also thank Tom and Liz, who have been working with us um, in terms of identifying uh, strategies to uh, continue to su support uh, through their uh, through funding and through professional development some of the programs that we continue to offer to support our students. Um, so I want to thank you for that. And again, this is part of our um, this is part of our academic program, as uh, Mr. Um, Tresvant mentioned, and as was identified in the program uh, in the uh, newsletter recently. Uh, we have our program, academic program of studies, but we also need to make sure we round out our students with extracurricular activities and certainly with sports to provide students that whole holistic approach to learning uh, at the high school and to maintain the purity of our comprehensive nature. Uh, the more restrictions we have, uh, the less opportunity kids get to flourish in multiple ways. So um, we wanna thank you for your support and your stewardship of the program of, of studies in the past and hopefully as well for the future to, to give every student the opportunity to succeed and, and, succeed and to reach their uh, level of, uh, of uh, preparation for, for beyond. So at this time, I'd like to introduce our uh, Paige Corwin Clare, who will speak to the first slide, uh, basically talking about our values uh, and also um, uh, each department chair and maybe at this moment, uh, we can unmute them because we're going to be each one is going to be presenting uh, their particular slide and then at the end perhaps we can entertain questions that might be uh, relevant to um, uh, any particular department or area. Paige. Good evening. First I just want to say I'm really excited about the format for sharing the program of studies this year. Um, I think it's so important for our department chairs to be able to share their voice and their passion for the incredible work that they're doing every day. Um, this first slide 
is familiar to all of you, I'm sure. It focuses on our collective beliefs about student learning, um, highlighting the goal of our district strategic plan and serving as the framework for all of the um, curriculum development before at PHS. <laughs> Um, so again, our department chairs have been working diligently within their departments to continue to develop a diverse curriculum with opportunities for growth and collaboration for all of our students um, so that they are college and career ready when they graduate from Portsmouth High School. Um, so for this evening, each of the department chairs have created a brief presentation. They're gonna keep it all to within a minute for their slide, um, although they're very passionate, so it might be a go over in a couple cases, um, but it highlights their successes um, both in what they've started in the past, but also what their successes have been through this hybrid learning environment, um, as well as their curriculum proposals and their goals within their departments. Um, so Diane Kreese will start us off um, first presenting about our CTE programs, computer science and fine arts. So Diane. I know I saw her there. Uh, I'm here. Oh, there we go. I, I was able, trying to get that unmuted. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, all right, I uh, said so I'm I'm Diane Kreese, I'm the CTE Computer Science and Fine Arts Department Chair. And the first area of curriculum updates um, relates to our CTE Academy for Media Communications and Digital Video Production. We're going to be embedding the ride requirement of an industry credential into our program. The credential will be the Adobe Premiere Pro certification. All ride approved CT programs are required to have an industry credential embedded within the curriculum. Uh, for the industry video, uh, the digital video program, we're going to embed the Adobe Premiere Pro certification into our third um, required course, Digital Video 3. Um, and then uh, the next one are the pathway endorsement. I've been researching um, the viability of offering the following pathways. Um, business, biomedical, graphic design, computer science, uh, music, the completion of a CT program or a program of study or pathway endorsement may be used to fulfill the graduation requirement of a performance-based diploma assessment. A recent report from the Rhode Island um, uh, Commerce of the State's Economy documents that Rhode Island should continue to focus on the advanced industry clusters that were mentioned in the pathways biomedical innovations, IT software, cyber physical systems, data analytics, advanced business services, and they also uh, mentioned the importance of what are called opportunity clusters to Rhode Island's um, economy. So that those clusters include art, education, hospitality, tourism, graphic design pathway would be located under that category. And I also specifically would like to mention that pathway criminal justice that will be fully implemented by the social studies department uh, next year will serve as an outstanding example of how the pathways will be organized. So it's 2021-22 school year. They have done a beautiful job of putting it into place. Um, and then the last one is our new course of the <coughs> is the computer science um, department and it's entitled Introduction to Programming, Apt Inventory. It's a semester course. It fulfills the 0.5 credit, credit technology requirement. Um, and it will introduce the students to coding. After the students have had exposure to coding, they'll have the opportunity to develop their skills in level computer science courses, which include programming with Java, AP, computer science. So, Mr. Can go Carrara, to the next slide. Mr. Carrara is next. Yes. Hi. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Don Carrara, <laughs> department chair at Portsmouth High School. Um, just for our updates for this current year, uh, in the spring, we're actually running an additional EEP course. We already have one for writing uh, with URI, and we're introducing one in the spring called Introduction to Film that is affiliated with CCRI. So we are looking um, forward to that and uh, Mary Kate O'Keefe is teaching it and uh, it's building off of her language of literature film that has run for several years. So students have to take that as a prerequisite before taking this course. So we're excited to get that off the ground and, and hopefully continue running that again next year. Uh, 
the 21-22 school year, um, our current English 12 track, we have talked about for years that we needed uh, additional options for students to earn a full year's credit of English. So we have our current English 12, Brit Lit, World Lit kind of hybrid. We have our AP literature and composition. So we're also hoping to propose a couple different options for students next year in conjunction with those. One would be a comedy uh, writing for publication hybrid. And the second one would be a social justice creative writing hybrid where those elements would be fused together, could also be taught in isolation at times. And we ended up getting some of these ideas through South Kingston. Um, I had reached out to the department chair over there and talked to her a little bit about the troubleshooting of this and how they went about getting options for kids. Um, so we ended up creating a survey of several different courses that you know, we got from South Kingston, we kind of thought about on our own, and we surveyed our current juniors and our current seniors, and we looked at that data, and these are the ones that came back with the most interest, so it definitely is student-driven. Um, so I think the plan down the road is to kind of eventually yeah, not necessarily phase out, but maybe fewer courses for the traditional track and, and some of these options along the way. And I think this also goes in conjunction with, uh, I've been working with um, Liz Viveros and Tannen and the whole um, Ed Reports team. I've been happy to be part of that, looking at the new ELA curriculum. So uh, we actually sat through several demos yesterday from different um, companies and we're hoping to actually get some of these uh, demos and the videos out to our teachers in January to get their feedback and start piloting some things uh, for this adoption of a new ELA curriculum. So we hope to pilot a few things this year and pilot some things next year with the, the full implementation for the 22-23. So we're hoping all of these things can align and, and we're really excited about where we're headed uh, to meet our current students in the 21st century. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Joel? Um, I don't see Joel on the panel. Mm. Mr. Amro. Thank you. Okay. Uh, well, phys ed is always on the move. Uh, we have, uh, we're introducing uh, some new activities as part of the phys ed program. Uh, and also um, in the social justice program, they're also utilizing the uh, fitness program to uh, augment uh, those that might, might want to go into uh, law enforcement. So they're uh, also, as you know, they also have a, uh, the, the phys ed program also has a, a program associated with uh, sports fitness uh, and sports medicine. And so that's something that's also uh, possible to be able to bring together as a pathway with the uh, science department. So we're really excited about that. Uh, it's been difficult with distance learning uh, to, to do all the work that needs to be done, uh, but uh, the uh, program of studies uh, for next year is going to be pretty much as it is this year with some of the minor tweaks in terms of uh, actual activities. Okay. Next slide. Sarah. Ah, Sarah? Library Media. I'm yeah. Sarah Hunicky, the school librarian. Uh, so most of my program is embedded in other departments curriculum. Uh, so in the ninth grade, we have moved out of English nine. It, it was primarily, it was only in English nine uh, in the past. Now it's also embedded in civics. So those skills are spread throughout the year through all four, um, well, 20 sections, but all four teachers um, classes. I also still provide on-demand research and information literacy instruction. So that is um, media literacy, print uh, visual literacy, um, and then our traditional literacies as well. And then I'm involved with the department curriculum work. I sat in on those product demos or publisher demos yesterday for the English department. I've been a part of their senior English courses uh, in those creation, uh, in those proposals. And then in social studies, we are scaffolding media literacy skills at each level as they are revising their curriculum so that uh, all of our students are information 
literate and media savvy um, and creators of information and not just consumers. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Hi, everyone. Marilyn? I'm Marilyn. <laughs> Jumping right in there, Joe. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Marilyn Thompson, Social Studies Department Chair. Uh, right now, we are very much in the thick of implementing our new curriculum. Um, we have uh, scaffolded different courses over time. And uh, currently this year, um, we have started the U.S. History One and the U.S. History Two classes. Uh, it's brand new this year. And then next year, just so you all are aware, uh, we are ultimately going to be switching the um, years in which students take U.S. history. We're going to switch them between 10th and 11th. So all 10th and 11th graders next year will be taking U.S. history so we can flip the courses. Um, and then uh, the 2022-23 year, uh, that's when we will uh, introduce our modern world history course. So it will go civics, U.S. 2, modern world history at the high school. And at that point, we will also have the uh, curriculum from the Massachusetts framework, which is what we're using to model um, our curriculum work. We will have all of the grades from six through 11th in history, completely vertically and horizontally aligned. Um, and based on conversations that I had with Liz Baveros this year, we are um, definitely going to begin to work on the incorporation of K through five so that we will be completely aligned um, all the way from kindergarten to you know, throughout their entire career at uh, Portsmouth. Um, in the pathway front, we are uh, starting our criminal justice pathway. We have held off a little bit because of COVID in terms of introducing the opportunity for students officially. Um, our core sequence is going to be criminal justice, which is brand new this year, first year of doing it. Next year, we are going to um, have a new, another new course, which will be the second one in the sequence called Issues in Criminal Justice. And then for their last choice in the pathway, students will have the choice between AP Psychology or AP US Government and Politics, depending on where their passion is really starting to gear towards in criminal justice. Um, I'd like to just put a quick note in that I've been working very heavily with Maddie Peary, um, in the Portsmouth Police Department, and they are um, very excited to help us continue to build the opportunities for students. And then the last thing that I'd like to highlight is a new course that we started this year. I actually talked to uh, Mr. Payero last year regarding this. Uh, it's a course which we're excited about because it addresses intensely the social emotional learning standards and its personal psychology. It's a half year course, uh, which is designed to help students understand a lot about um, psychology as it applies to them, particularly in regards to stress and coping mechanisms. Um, and it is obviously very incredibly applicable to where we're at today. Um, but I just wanted to highlight that it's going really well, getting a lot of positive student feedback in terms of how the course has helped them so far this year to adapt to some of the stressors they're experiencing. So we're excited. Thanks, Marilyn. Hi everybody, my name is Jeff Rose. I'm the math department chairperson. Um, I'll try and keep it to my one minute, but I, you know, I'm a little <laughs> bit overboard here. Um, I'm excited to announce we've expanded our EEP options for students. Last year, we began our uh, EEP enrollment options with college algebra. This year, we've also introduced the financial algebra honors course. Both of those are offered through Southern Maine Community College. We had a few roadblocks with our Rhode Island institution. So Mr. Amaral and I were able to get a, some, you know, some support from our neighbors to the north. And we have 21 students this year opting in for college credit in their math classes this year. So that's you know, tremendous. Um, we're also piloting some new curriculum for algebra one and geometry. It's Envisions, which is all green rated in ed reports. Our teachers are really enjoying the curriculum. We're loving the rigor. Uh, the online access for students is phenomenal and the usability is great for teachers and for students alike. Additionally, this year we have a full-time math interventionist, which I think is a really great uh, thing to highlight for our department. We're doing a lot of things for our honors and EEP programs, but we're also doing everything that we can to support our students who struggle in math as well. So this year for the first time ever, we have a full-time teacher dedicated to supporting our students who have um, some gaps in math. I've reached out to the department chairperson over at Barrington my alma mater to kind of model our program after what they're doing. And I'm excited to see what benefits we have with our students because of that. 
Next year, we're looking forward to full implementation of the new Envisions curriculum, not just in Algebra 1 and Geometry, but also in Algebra 2. So rather than piloting the curriculum for Algebra 2, we're, you know, it's, it's an extension of what we're currently doing. We're just deciding to go full boat Algebra 1, Geometry, and Algebra 2 with the new curriculum. And moving forward, we're going to explore some business pathways with business and finance courses. I think that's a great need. I think it's something that a lot of our students are interested in, and I'm excited to have mathematics be the bridge that connects those two things. Thank you, Jeff. Lynn? Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Lynn Hogan, and I'm the Modern World Languages Department <coughs> Chair. So um, the first item on the um, update here has to do with our uh, national proficiency exams, which we're planning on administering during online for all three languages. Um, you can see the dates here. The, um, for all three, they go from uh, mid-February until uh, the second week of April. So we're looking forward to, to giving those. Pretty soon we'll be registering students to participate in those tests. Um, there, there, uh, there are some pretty good uh, benefits to those. Um, Oftentimes um, students can use that as a, a way to sort of self-evaluate and see their progress in their proficiency levels um, in their language studies. Um, it's also something that they can, um, you know, put on their, their college applications. Um, and then for the second item on here for the update, I've um, noted that uh, we've been working on our curriculum needs assessment uh, during our uh, professional development day in November, we started unpacking our updated ACTFL standards and reviewed our um, scope and sequences by language and levels and started identifying gaps and um, overlaps and redundancies, as well as evaluating um, the, the rigor for, for our program. Thank you, Lynn. Okay. Nicole? Did we have Nicole Noble on the? Uh... Yes, she's on there. Yes, oh, okay. well, she muted herself. Hold on one second. Here we go. Hi, everyone. I'm sorry. I was trying to unmute myself. Um, good evening. My name is Nicole Noble, and I'm the science department chairperson. Um, there's only a few minor um, program updates for science this year. Um, in advanced placement physics, um, the program update that we are proposing is to remove AP Physics 2 from our program of studies. This is a one credit course that is meant to follow AP Physics 1, and it has been in our program of study studies for the past um, about five years, but we have had zero enrollments in it because students typically take AP Physics as a senior. Um, we would also like to update the AP Physics C um, description to more clearly indicate that it is a two credit course that covers both AP Physics C mechanics and AP Physics C electricity and magnetism. So it's really just a wording update for those um, to more clearly um, depict that for the um, families. I would also like to propose a science elective change. Um, we had we have previously had a course oceanography. It's a one credit course that runs every other year. And we'd like to update this to now be called space and ocean science, which would have um, approximately half of the year would be oceanography still, but the other half of the year would be astronomy based. And last, we would like to update the science fair requirement. Previously, all honors freshmen and sophomores were required to complete the science fair um, as a course requirement. We'd like now to um, update that so that it would be a freshman course requirement and optional in grades 10 through 12, but all freshmen would do the science fair. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. I believe Brooke's next. Yeah, Brooke is She's on the other. Um, and this is just a quick update on what's uh, going on in special ed. Um, all of our IP meetings are being held virtually during the 2021 school year. The co-teaching co model is being fully implemented through Foldell. And our PHS transition program is providing students with in-person work experience, independent living skills, and community-based activities. Okay. 
Thank you, Brooke. I believe that's the uh, program of studies in a nutshell. Uh, there's more specific uh, in the actual program of studies that will be that you're voting on tonight. It has a specific list of courses. Uh, some of the uh, courses that are in the program of studies, you'll notice that it's a new concept that is being used um, in that some courses are running odd years, some courses are running even years in order for courses to actually run. If we don't do it that way, if we run the same electives every year that don't have enough students, then they never run. They'll have six, seven, eight students and they just don't have the capacity. But we're hoping that if we run some of these electives every other year, we might be able to get to that threshold of 15 students to be able to run those courses uh, on a uh, free, uh, on a, on a uh, sequential, in a sequential manner where students can count on those courses running. So uh, this is uh, the work, uh, the embodiment of all the work of the teachers, the department chairs, the, uh, the, the uh, administration at the high school, as well as the central office, making sure that we can offer this comprehensive approach. And we're gonna see more changes. This is, again, this is the first year. We're gonna continue to offer more pathways as you saw in some of the presentations. That's really exciting. I, I, I can't tell you how exciting that is because that gives kids a real, uh, certified by us, an opportunity for them to get really deep and uh, take courses that are tied to one another where those teachers can actually speak to one another about curriculum and be able to uh, give students a real good opportunity in that area or their field of interest. So when they go to college, and a lot of the colleges now, when you have to declare sort of like where you're gonna be very soon. And if they at least have some ideas uh, about what their interests are, uh, then they can choose the right career path and the right program of studies in the coll collegiate level, which we think is very important. We don't want students going in thinking they want to be business majors, but they really hadn't had the, uh, the pathway or experience to know how that feels, if that makes sense for them. So the more opportunities we have to give those kids you know, chances to explore different courses and pathways uh, will be uh, something I think that's really exciting. Great, thank you so much. That was that was a great idea to have the presentation with the department heads and really, really enjoyed that. Um, questions, I'm sure we have a bunch. Yes, Mr. Ferber. Um, uh, Joe, I, I think I heard last year you were hoping to start a marketing course. Did that not make the cut? We're, we're trying to see if we can put that together as part of a business pathway. And we're probably one year away from being able to put all the courses together. Uh, you mentioned marketing. Uh, we have a financial algebra course. Uh, we also have a graphics course. And we're also thinking uh, we had some strong interest in the math department to contribute to the business program and offering a macroeconomics course. That's an uh, AP level course that will also be tied to that pathway. We didn't want to really introduce programs this year or courses this year that were going to be scattered. It had to it, if we're going to introduce new courses, it had to be defined to a particular pathway or design. But that is part of our idea for next year of introducing that business wow. pathway, of putting that that those programs together. So that's not it might not be happening as a course next year, but it's certainly in in the contention under the business pathway for the following year. Thanks. Thank you. Anybody else? So. I'm making sure I'm not jumping in here. Okay. Um, so um, I, I think it sounds really exciting, first of all. I mean, I can tell you guys have been doing a lot of planning and a lot of hard work, really, really thinking about how to order and organize and streamline. I was really pleased, though, to also hear that um, I think it was Ms. Noble was talking about in science, getting rid of a class, right? Um, because I, I think, um, you know, if we're not teaching things at the high school, we really shouldn't have them in the, the catalog. And so I only heard one that we're getting rid of, and I hear a lot that we're adding. So that makes me wonder about things like staffing. And I'm, I know at the high school in the past, we've had concerns with students not being able to get necessarily their, their classes, you know, like, so they want to... Uh, the new financial algebra class, or they want, you know, classes which they may not have enough sections of. So I guess my question would be, um, are we, 
are we getting rid of some things? Are we, I like the every other year, are we go, then going to guarantee that those classes will run? Is that something you would need from us as a school committee or the district to promise that, you know, we, if we're going to offer these things, they will run? Um, so what are your thoughts on those? Well, we, some of the courses that currently haven't run, for instance, the theater one and theater two courses have not run, but we've introduced introduction to film, which is an is a EP program that hopefully will have enough interest to be able to run. So some of the courses are changing. Uh, this year, for instance, we offered uh, a numerous numbers of sections of economics. But next year, we're going to be offering personal psychology because we've really exhausted the uh, the ability for every student that wanted to take economics this year to be able to take it. So next year, we're going to try to work on personal psychology. That's one of those odd even year courses. And if we are successful in getting um, um, ma macroeconomics approved next year, then that might actually supplant the economics course because uh, the only person that right now that can teach the EEP economics course is Mr. Mara. He is retiring and you need to have a master's in that area in order to be certified as an EEP course. So we're looking at an AP option to supplant the economics course perhaps two years from now. So a lot of the courses um, are changed or evolved into different courses uh, that wasn't necessarily um, demonstrated in the program of studies. So it might seem like they're new courses, but some are courses that perennially haven't run, that we have not put in the program of studies or converted to odd even years to provide more interest or changed altogether uh, to adapt to either an AP level course or an EEP level course. Uh, or we had the same, like for instance, in our senior English program, we have all those sections there, but we're giving more student choice and voice in picking what English 12 um, genre they wanna pick in order to stay motivated in, in, in really learn and uh, be able to pick an area that they're really interested in. So it's not that we're adding more, we're adding more courses, but we're not adding more sections. So we should be able to be within our, uh, the current levels of staffing that we currently have. Okay. Uh, my, my second question and last question, then I'll make sure other people have the chance, is I saw in the program of study guidance talked about what all they do, right? Um, are, I, I didn't see, or maybe I missed it, I really like this every other year class option so that if you come in as a freshman, you're like, okay, and I want to take, you know, um, space, and, space and ocean science. I know it's going to be offered my junior year and my freshman year, which they probably wouldn't take then, right? Um, are the guidance, are, are, we, are we creating a system so that students will know as freshmen or incoming freshmen kind of what's out in which year and they can kind of look at that four-year plan and are we communicating that out to parents too? Yes, it, it is our goal to, to when we meet with the eighth grade students uh, in, at the middle school uh, to give them a chart and an overview not only of all the different options and programs we have at the high school but to also let them know what courses are going to be offered which years. So it's going to be a uh, an even year course, so they have two shots at getting into that course um, or two shots for the other course that usually runs parallel to that. Uh, so for instance, uh, you mentioned um, space uh, and uh, earth, uh, no, space and oceanography. That runs parallel to re renewable energy. So those are always, they never would run the same year. They'll always be opposite one another. So students who want to take an elective have a chance to plan out their four years based on when those courses are gonna be offered. Um, in years past, sometimes courses haven't run, like renewable energy is a, a course that sometimes uh, has run. Oceanography, when it was a standalone, didn't always run because we didn't have the interest. Uh, at least three years ago, we didn't run it. So the students that wanted to take it couldn't take it. But now if they know that they're, uh, they're two years away, take two years worth of interest, and you might have 15 or 18 students, which makes the best sense, and, I, and, I, and I, I can't take credit for that idea. This was part of a study that came out of the district management group that suggested that many of the districts that are trying to create comprehensive programs utilize this strategy to provide students with 
um, the same array of courses, but not having to cancel as many courses because of low enrollment. So I think it's worked in other districts and talking to some of my fellow colleagues. And I think we're introducing that this year as a way to, to keep the programs, the programs going uh, and making sure that they run. We also know it can be so overwhelming for families. You're thinking there's so many options and I want them to do this and they're all excited about this. So a couple ways that we've transformed this is this, this group here with the department chairs has really done a great job creating a comprehensive um, slideshow that's a lot more than just the changes. It really outlines like what it could potentially look for your four years in English with the opportunities. And this is all put together. It's done um, last year. We did it in person for parents for both the the eighth grade night in addition to new students, but it, we also post that and really go back to it a lot because it's very helpful for parents, but also Beth Farley in IT did an amazing job of moving this to an online forum. So for instance, when you're going in to sign up for your eighth grade or ninth grade classes and all the eighth grade is shown exactly how to do it. And again, with, with as the grades move forward, but it shows you as a freshman or a sophomore junior, here's your pathway, here's your options for all sophomore classes. You can also see the ones for your junior. So you could potentially not think you're getting stuck in an area. You can say, okay, it's a sophomore, I'm gonna take this. And then for next year, these are my other opportunities. So it yeah. really, besides you know the, the opportunities for guidance counselors to meet individually with students to ensure that they're getting, they're on the right pathway, they have as many languages, all of that piece, um, really to kind of get that interest in what are these kids interested in doing so that they're not a, then a junior thinking, oh, I really would have liked that CTE program. So mm -hmm. I think the more information you can give to parents without being overwhelming, because it's really about showing them, here's all your opportunities, but we don't want you tagged into one little area. So the better communication we can do that through all different means, I think we're just getting better and better at it. So with the help of these guys, because they are the ones that can really showcase what they're doing in their department. Yeah, I, 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 I really applaud that because I think it's not just about like finding what you love, but it's also figuring about what you don't like. You know, exactly. you might think, oh, I want to go into psychology or something. And then you're like, no, nah, I really don't. Right. So you have a little bit of exposure and you can then switch in and out. That That's kind of in my, so this is really with the CTE questions. Um, you mentioned they have to have a professional certification, Ms. Crease, for um, I think you were talking about the video. What are the professional certifications for the child development and the um, uh, engineering? We'll get you unmuted there. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad you, um, <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, for child development, the requirement is the, they have to complete the program in the teacher assistant training program. So, um, and that's, um, and I'm also looking at Educators Rising. It's a new pilot program that we're also looking at, but, the, but I'm very excited about the teacher um, assistant training program. That's the credential there. Engineering, they have to complete that third level course where they work with a mentor. Um, the credential is that they have to show that they have computer generated um, software exposure. So they're working with advanced CAD. That's where the okay. certificate. Mm -hmm. And then, um, for visual arts, they have to, um, it, it ties in with their AP courses as well. So they'll have an exhibition at numerous places. They work with lots of different museums, but they have to show those 15 works of art. And that's, they have like three different ways to meet the credit. They have, there are three from the state asks and they have, they could pick one of those three and they have all three, so. Okay. Other questions, comments? Emily, if I could just say a few words. Sure, Liz. I just want to take a moment to recognize the thoughtful process that the high school took with developing this program of studies, meeting with their teacher team, surveying students and families, along with meeting and discussing the plans at length with, with the school and with district leadership, um, especially me, being that I'm new to all of this this year. Um, student, parent, teacher voice is so important. And I really feel like uh, they took all of this into account when they developed this. So I also just wanted to thank all of the teachers um, that presented this evening. I know it's not easy and I truly appreciate that. I muted myself in case you missed it. We got two new puppies. So I'm kind of trying to mute the stuff here every now and then. Um, so um, seeing no further questions or comments, last call. I think we uh, have a motion for discussion and approval of the PHS program of studies for 
would this be 2021, 22, I believe, right? Yes. Um, ready to call the vote. Uh, and I have to find my committee members. Mr. Ferber. Aye. Uh, Mr. Vadney. Aye. Is that an aye? Ms. Kelly. Uh, Mr. Shears. Aye. Uh, Ms. McDade. Aye. Mr. Payero. Aye. Emily Copeland, aye. Approved, 7-0. Thank you all so much for the hard work and the, the presentation. It was really, really interesting. Very exciting, very exciting. Um, okay, um, can I have a motion for discussion and approval of a one-year contract extension for Council 94, Local 2669, please? So moved. Second. Um, Dr. Kenworthy. Dr. Copeland, uh, so as, as you are aware, uh, the contract for Council 94 Local 2669 is expiring at the end of the school year. This is um, one of our, our two main collective bargaining unit, units, um, obviously the other being um, NEA Portsmouth for uh, our teachers uh, and certified professionals. So Council 94 covers all of our non-certified professionals, including clerical, uh, custodial maintenance, um, professionals and, and so forth. So um, we did, uh, before entering into uh, an extended contract negotiation, we had floated the idea with Council 94 of a one-year contract extension for a 1% uh, salary increase. And um, so they, they did accept that and that is what you have. Um, and you have that extension prepared by Attorney Carroll and the attorney for their organization in your backup, including a financial impact statement from Mr. Dioro um, for what that 1% uh, increase would look like. Thank you. Any questions, comments for either Dr. Kenworthy or Attorney Carroll? No? All right. Uh, seeing none, uh, I shall call the vote here. Mr. Ferber? Aye. Mr. Vadney? Aye. Mr. Shears? Aye. Mr. Payero? Aye. Ms. McDade, can't hear you, sorry, got to mute. Thank you, Ms. Kelly. Uh, very soft, but I think I heard you. Uh, Emily Copeland, I uh, approved 7-0. Um, like to thank Attorney Carroll and, and her counterpart at Council 94 and our local reps for um, getting that done, that, that uh, really appreciate it. So approved 7-0. Um, Thank you. Uh, can I have a motion for discussion, action, authorizations of funds to hire a transportation routing consultant, I believe in the sum of up to $10,000. So moved. Second. Dr. Kenworthy. All right, thank you. Uh, so I did allude to this uh, when I was giving the update on the um, ad hoc transportation subcommittee. Um, so again, just trying to, to make a, any substantive change um, in, in our busing contract is going to require a comprehensive review of our routes. We have not done that in a number of years. Uh, so based on the, you know, the discussion and agreement that came out of that committee um, and, and in my consultation with Dr. Copeland, um, I did ask Mr. Dioro um, to um, Go, go back to the consultant that we had used the last time he's done other work with um, this consultant. Uh, so this was a quick turnaround to put a proposal together for you. Um, but there, there is a, a timeliness factor here because we have to conduct this study and, and get the results and get an RSP out there for a new transportation contract. So um, Mr. Dioro, did I uh, leave anything important out there that you want to fill in? Um, no, I, I think you hit all the key points. This is um, obviously it's going to be a little bit more than just a routing uh, study. They will look at operations. They'll look at policies. Um, and um, we've talked, I think, on many occasions that in Portsmouth, our transportation costs are particularly high compared to our neighboring districts. Um, and this is probably a study that is uh, well um, overdue. So um, it will be done. The target dates are uh, between February 1st and March 30th, about a six to eight week turnaround. And just in case uh, those of you that were 
around at the time, Futures um, Education, as well as uh, Rich Labrie, who's going to be the main consultant, did uh, the work for us back when we were analyzing uh, whether to stay in or leave the um, special education region. Mr. Ferber. Um, this, up till now, it's been the bus companies themselves that have done this. I mean, I know it hasn't been as comprehensive, but it's been, hasn't it been the bus companies themselves that have used whatever analytics they have for determining the bus routes? Yes, it, it, it's definitely the bus companies that put together uh, bus routes in, in almost every community, but um, this will be an independent view um, that will take a look at those routes uh, look for efficiencies, you know, challenge things that maybe have been embedded and ha have happened for years and years and people don't question anymore. So um, hopefully it'll be fresh eyes that will help us see if we can make some um, efficiency gains. A big, yeah, I've got a comment. Yeah. Besides the uh, routes, uh, in conjunction with that, I hope that they're going to look at where our sidewalks are and access way, because if we're asking uh, the students for the pickup at their houses or along the routes, I think that's an important issue that some of the other communities uh, maybe have more sidewalks, access ways, safer ways. So maybe there needs to be some cooperation between uh, the uh, on the school side and the town side and in a long term way to to address some of these issues. Yes, we'll, we'll certainly make sure that when we take a look at the uh, um, the routing that we take into consideration, safety factors and sidewalks and all that kind of um, information. Mr. Fajero? Uh, Chris, uh, as just an initial review, I wanted to know if there was any, in just reviewing the scope of work, and it's not really enumerated, but if there was going to be any input from the community, um, because typically if we're just looking at what is there and what it looks like in numbers and cents, the people that tend to get most out of it is the people who actually consume the product and which is our children. I just wanted to know if they had any intention of either facilitating a focus group or just reaching out to families in the district and about the current service. That's not listed in the scope of work. I can certainly talk to them about maybe doing some sort of uh, district-wide survey if we can land on some um, you know, key questions, that type of thing. Um, I can ask him what maybe he's done in that realm and other and other districts and see if we can incorporate it. Appreciate that. Looking to see Ms. McDade, no, okay. Um, I have a couple of questions and following up on Mr. Payero's comment, um, we had that um, program, I don't know if we still have it now where we could push out threads for people to comment and discuss. Do we still have that? Uh, we okay. do not. Uh, we, we did, not. We did okay. not renew. We did not renew that. We didn't. It, it, I mean, it was it was an it's interesting okay. program, but it carried an expensive price tag. We yeah, just didn't no, feel like we were getting. Yeah. No, because I was thinking that might be a way that, you know, we could we could survey the, um, the community itself, but we don't have that anymore. That's fine. Yeah. Um, and following up on Mr. Shears with the safety, are they looking at um, cameras on buses or speeding and anything like that? Is that part of that? So or we that have be part of the bid. Yeah, that that's really incorporated into the contract. I mean, we we currently have cameras on our buses um, for inside the bus. Um, the contract, the RFP that we just put out will actually be going out tomorrow um, is it includes uh the requirement that we have cameras inside the bus. And it also says that uh, we're allowed to put um, cameras on the outside of buses to capture, um, you know, cars that are passing stop buses, et cetera. So we have that right. I think, you know, we explored that in the past, but you, when by the time the contract was running out, it made no sense to be putting that stuff in, but that's something we can certainly um, do in the next five-year contract. And then um, uh, I know it, this is routes, but and I know Mr. Tresvan's still on here too, but is it also going to include things like buses for sports teams or band or music and, and our utilization of that? Or is that just part of a extra bus rate or something like that? Yeah, th those costs are actually quoted in the RFP. So we ask for costs for extracurriculars. 
I don't expect that he'll be spending any time analyzing those routes because they really are ad hoc. We have a game. We don't know where we're going to go for playoffs until they happen. And, and we have to kind of go where we have to go. Really easy to be focusing on um, why do we have two to three times as many buses as our, as our neighboring communities when we may have very similar student populations and yeah. how do we get that down? And um and this maybe ties back into what Mr. Payer was thinking about. Is your idea that that the consultant will provide us with maybe two or three options or just say, you know, here's what you have to do? Oh, no, I, I think that they're going to be providing us a uh, menu of different options that we can choose from. OK. And then we do have that that ad hoc transportation committee as well would be another key group to bring some of those ideas back to. Sounds great. Other comments? Looking, making sure I'm not cutting anybody off. Seeing nothing in the chat. Okay. Uh, call for the vote. Uh, Mr. Ferber. Aye. Ms. McDade. Aye. Mr. Vadney. Aye. Mr. Shears. Aye. Mr. Payero. Aye. Ms. Kelly. Aye. Emily Copeland, aye. Approved 7-0, thank you. Um, can I have a motion and action for a one-time waiver of family sick time limit in district contracts? So moved. Second. Dr. Kenworthy. Thank you, so I, I am bringing this uh, uh, item forward tonight asking for your uh, review, discussion, um, review and approval. Um, so, uh, our, our two main collective bargaining contracts in any course with the in council 94. Uh, and then this does also uh, trickle down into all other individual contracts. Uh, the number of family sick days that an in individual can take per year is capped at five. Um, and in a, in a typical year, that's, you know, been a, a limit that everyone's aware of and, um, you know, makes do with. Um, and uh, just to further clarify, that is not a separate allotment of sick time that that is within the, the sick time that an individual gets um, in their contract. Um, but then they, they can typically use up to five uh, per year for family sick. Um, the number of total sick days varies uh, by, by contracts as well when you're looking at NEA Council 94, whatever it is. Um, so with, with COVID-19 and some things we are experiencing this year, uh, this is just an item I'm asking for your approval um, just so we can have as an option um, as, as we're, we're helping people sort through the different situations that come up. Um, we think that this would be very helpful uh, and it would be a one-time waiver of that, that, that five-day limit. What I'm proposing is that we allow people to utilize up to their annual allotment. So again, that varies by contract. Um, you know, it's different for NEA, again, as it is for Council 94, but we would at least, um, you know, kind of try to balance it that way. Uh, individuals could use up to their annual allotment and uh, with approval from me. So once they hit their five day limit, they would have to make a request to me. I would then approve that with uh, someone I wanted to introduce uh, officially to the committee tonight. So we, we have on here, uh, this is Kim McGuire and, and you, you of course approved her contract back in the summer. You've heard us mention her many times, um, but we were able to bring her on uh, as our Director of Human Resources. And uh, this was a position we were looking to fill for a number of reasons for a couple of years, but I cannot tell you how valuable it, it has been to have Kim on board with everything we are dealing with, with COVID-19 and these family situations. So uh, Kim, did you want to take the opportunity and elaborate on any of that? Um, you, you, you definitely helped me craft this, uh, this idea and this agenda item. Yes, Dr. Camberley, thank you. So. Um, what we're seeing is, and, and the concern is an increase in the need for family sick time this year, you know, specifically around uh, the, the pandemic. Uh, not necessarily related to COVID per se, but there are many restrictions in schools uh, across the state and, and neighboring states um, on attendance for students um, for minor illnesses as well. So whereby in a typical year, um, for good or bad, students can attend school with minor illness. Uh, this year we're seeing you know, that that is not the case. They, all schools have their staff at a stations that, that require them to stay home for even those reasons. Um, as Dr. Kenworthy stated in a typical year, a five day limit on family sick is, has been sufficient. 
Um, but this year, there is not there is the anticipated increase in that. We've already seen some of our staff meet that five-day limit. Um, so this is, again, uh, five days of their, it's the total allotment of their sick time, not additional. And what we're asking is just to kind of lift that limitation on the family sick and allow them to use their total allotment for uh, a family situation or their own illness. Okay. Um, I, I guess, uh, Attorney Carol, I don't want to put you on the spot here, but maybe I'll give you a minute to think about it and see if there are other questions. But legally, is there are there any concerns no. or precedents? Or I mean, I'm sure you you've you've talked about this, but yeah, yes. yeah. Let, let me just and if I didn't clarify again, um, just clarify. This would only be for. The, the remainder of this school year. That, that's what we're saying. So sorry, Attorney Carroll. No, and, and as long as um, the, the unions agree, and of course they're <laughs> going to agree because it's a benefit to them and it's a benefit that they need this year. Um, I certainly agree with um, Dr. Kenworthy and Mrs. Aguas' um, comments that this is something we need and it's not precedent setting. And um, it, it, we, in some contracts, we're looking to actually negotiate that um, that family sick um, um, days anyway, so I support it 100%. Um, questions, comments? Now, could Mr. Payero, I see you have a hand up. Emily, you go first. So let's say I'm a, a elementary school teacher with young kids and mm -hmm. they're sick at home. Could I choose? to do remote learning? How would that work right now? Or would I, I, I guess I'm thinking about staffing implications, right? I mean, right. obviously if they have to stay home, they have to stay home, but yeah, you know, I, so don't, the, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I mean, no, it's a good, it's a good question. And it gets into, again, I don't want to over compli complicate this particular issue, but uh, we obviously do, do have instances where, you, you know, we're going to be going full distance learning, right? As a district starting December 21st through, January 8th, but on any any given day, um, you, you know, all of all of our schools have students in even, you know, seven through 12, they're on a hybrid schedule. So uh, we, we do have situations uh, that come up. What we, we what we've taken the stance on in Portsmouth is we are limiting those work from home requests to COVID related. So again, that's another thing that Mrs. Aguirre, um, you know, help helps with greatly there is um, we have we have a process where, where people can request uh, that work from home option for a, a legitimate COVID related purpose. Um, they produce the documentation, she helps me review it. And then, um, you know, we, we oftentimes grant that request to work from home. Um, but again, just, uh, just to, to, you know, kind of help, help us, um, uh, you, know, you know, make sure we're not making arbitrary decisions here that we've kept it to uh, a uh, documented COVID related purpose for this year. So again, that, and just so you know, that would be separate from any, any of this. So if somebody's, somebody's using a sick day or using a family sick day, then it, it's because they or them, you know, either they're, they're too sick to work or a family member that they have to take care of. Uh, so th this all kind of goes hand in hand and just helping us, um, you know, what, what all districts are facing currently with, with COVID as it relates to staffing issues. I, I think that it's uh, it's a very very good that it shows uh, adaptability and uh, uh, for this year that's that's needed and I, I think it's within the parameters and that uh, I, I'm certainly in favor of it. Thank you, Mr. Fayero. Thank you. I, I I kind of and this is probably going to seem a little bit like showing cards, but uh, and uh, uh, I'm kind of. I, I want to understand why we still have kind of a five day arbitrary family leave because mm -hmm. it kind of comes from this mindset that sick time is allotted, not earned. Like obviously teachers are working in order to be able to accrue the sick time. So why wouldn't it be that we just make it, well, obviously it's contractual, but we, don't, we wouldn't want our families to be put in the situation whether they're using it or not, they can take a sick day because, they, it, because they're deciding whether or not they have to lie to an employer and say, hey, it's themselves, and then open up this other can of worms. Right. And 
being able to provide for their families. If we don't expect yeah. that and want that for our own families, why do we kind of have this kind of, for lack of a better word, punitive healthcare policy that we expect for, of our teachers? Can I, so, uh, Mr. Kenworthy, let me, uh, let okay. me answer that. All right. So in the <laughs> yeah. last contract, in the last contract <laughs> negotiations, we were actually negotiating that limit. Um, and then if you remember, um, we ended up in the pandemic and we had to get a shortened contract. But, um, it, you know, what, what Dr. Kenworthy is bringing to your attention tonight is something and what you are saying is something we were ready to negotiate out of the contract and never got there because the pandemic hit and we had to let it go. But I assure you it's something that, um, and it came from, I think it was Mr. Duro and um, Dr. Kenworthy as something that we needed to negotiate out. So you're right, we know it, we just haven't negotiated it out yet. Right. And so Thank obviously you with your, your approval, yeah, we, we, would, we would be able to kind of wait waive that and this would be a good test for the remainder of this year, um, you know, to see how many of those additional requests that we do get. I'm not seeing any other people wanting to raise hands or talk. Uh, call the vote. Um, Mr. Ferber. Aye. Uh, Ms. McDade. Aye. Mr. Vadney. Aye. Mr. Shears. Aye. Mr. Payero. Aye. Ms. Kelly. Aye. Emily Copeland. Aye. Approved 7 0. Um, yep. I, I, I applaud you, you know, looking out for the staff. I, I think it's a year we really have to, you know, people have been doing everything they can to make it work from their end, and we need to do what we can to help them make it work from our end. So um, nice job. And Ms. McGuire, thank you so much. <laughs> McGuire. Thank you. Um, OK, um, discuss a uh, motion for discussion and action for budget transfers greater than 5,000, please. So moved. Second. Mr. Dero. Yes, so uh, there's one budget transfer uh, tonight. We're asking for your approval. It is uh, related to installing electrical heat in the basement level of the admin building uh, where many of the rooms do not have heat and it can get fairly cold in the winter. Uh, this is something Dr. Colwell has been on top of us on for many years. So uh, hopefully- It's been a few years, but we feel that she's earned the heat. Yeah, we point, figured so. you know, it's the third year, so we might as well put heat in there. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so we're looking for um, a transfer out of miscellaneous expenses uh, of $6,500 into maintenance and repairs admin. I don't know. I don't. I don't see how we can discuss whether or not we should have you too much here. <laughs> um, other than I'm assuming you've already checked in to make sure that's the most uh, cost-efficient way to provide heat, okay. as opposed to a little coal stove or something. Yeah, that yeah. down there, it definitely is. Uh, with what what they have to work with, makes the most sense. All right, I'm just going to call the vote on this. One. <laughs> uh, Mr. Ferber. Aye. Mr. Shears. Aye. Mr. Radney. Aye. Uh, Ms. McDade. Aye. Mr. Payero. Aye. Ms. Kelly. Aye. Uh, Emily Copeland. I don't even have to think about this one. Aye. <laughs> uh, okay. Dr. Copeland, my fellow garden level colleagues are, are appreciative of the vote of the committee. Thank you. What are you going to want next? A bathroom? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what is this? <laughs> okay. Uh, can I have a motion for discussion and review budget transfers less than 5000 please? So moved. Second. Mr. Dero. Sure. So as, as you know, these are not um, items you need to approve, but we do want to report out on them on a monthly basis. Uh, again, I won't go through all of these. If you have any specific questions, I'm happy to answer them. But... They're just minor transfers that happen naturally in the course of business. Um, and and um, they for this past month, they totaled $8,543.72. Great, thank you for those. Any questions on any of the specific items? I, no. I, I just had that, Mr. Vadney, did you have a question? Uh, no, no questions. Sorry, you just highlighted on my screen there. Um, no. My, my one general question is, is, you know, if, 
if we're really concerned about the financial impact of the, the crisis and there are things that we don't have to spend money on, are we kind of halting spending or some of these transfers to kind of me? I know 8,000 isn't, isn't a lot of money, but if you add stuff up over several months, um, do we need to be thinking about that? Or are you fairly comfortable that we don't? So, so I don't know. Um, I'll, maybe I'll take a stab at that and then um, sure. Tom can answer yeah. as well. But uh, so these, so typically uh, when we approve like a school level budget, um, they have control between their lines. So if they wanted to oh. move dollars from math supplies to say English supplies or something like that, we, we've given them that leeway as long as it's not over $5,000. Um, the second part of that is absolutely if we felt that we were heading in a bad direction from a deficit standpoint. Um, the superintendent has the ability to shut down purchases um, completely or uh, put additional scrutiny on them. And in fact, he did do that last year. So I don't think we're at a point where we need to do that at this point. I'm not projecting that we have uh, any, we're not staring at a deficit, um, but certainly it's early in the year. There are a lot of unknowns and we will absolutely monitor that. You think I think we should think twice about putting heat in the basement. Uh, I, I think from a capital spending point of view, too, we're, we're looking at uh, essential uh, items in our planning. The building committee in their work is look, are looking at uh, items that are essential overall in, in the uh, school system. So I think that's on the mind on all different levels of the operation of the school system. Yeah, the only thing I was going to add there was, you know, we, we can't forget either that that this budget that we're still operating under technically, you know, just but by our calendar, you know that we're already starting to prepare next year's budget. So this budget that, uh, you know, is guiding this school year was crafted pre-COVID. So you can imagine, you know, in, in approved by the school committee and put put up for town council approval, I think it was right about the time that, you know, COVID was hitting, um, but, you know, very much did 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 not reflect the, the, the current reality of COVID. So you can imagine how many, you know, different things have come up uh, that we've had to to be creative about um, because of uh, distance learning, which is where we are right now with, with our, our current situation. All right, so uh, thank you for that report. We don't need to vote on that. And our last item is a motion for discussion and review of the district town natural gas contract. Chris, you can take this one as well. Oops, oh, sorry, motion first. Yep. Oh, motion uh, to yeah. discuss and review the district town natural gas contract. Thank you. Second. Second, okay, moved Second. and seconded. Mr. Dero. Sure. Um, so I, I think you know that uh, we, we, the school department, take the lead uh, working with the town to procure electric and uh, natural gas um, supplies. Our three-year contract uh, was expiring at the end of December. Uh, we contacted Direct Energy, who has the pre-bid RIASC contract, uh, back in early November to get some pricing. And we were looking at about a 35% increase in the cost of, of natural gas. Ouch. Um, yeah. Uh, so just to make sure that we explored all of our options and, uh, you know, not being a natural gas expert uh, myself, we did um, go out and find um, an energy um, um, uh, a consultant that would help us uh, go out and basically bid the combined town and school uh, supply. Um, we did that. Uh, we didn't like the prices we got. They were a little better than 35%, but we didn't like them. So uh, we continued uh, to wait that out as some of the uh, market conditions sort of moved in our favor. Uh, so recently we went and uh, bid it again and we saw an 18% increase, which, you know, about half of what we were looking at about a month ago, um, still not, you know, a, a great situation to be in. So what we decided to do is actually extend for, um, contract for 16 months, not three years. Um, typically, we always go with the three-year contract, hoping that um, that'll get us through two winters, and then we can go out and bid it again and hopefully have more favorable uh, market prices. So 
Uh, we did contract uh, and enter into that contract. The town did the exact same thing. We just wanted to make you aware of that. Yeah. Have, have we explored uh, solar uh, and some of the other alternatives? Because uh, I know you've you've uh, approached the uh, natural natural gas, but we do have a lot of uh, rooftops and uh, some of the areas, and and I just think that uh, uh, when you're looking at increases like that, if if we have and and it's a and a, an issue that's been totally explored or, and then, or maybe revisited. Uh, but I certainly, you know, think that uh, it, it's, it's a way that we really shouldn't, uh, you know, we shouldn't exhaust that avenue. We, we have looked at that in the past and, and really there's a, a very complicating factor to that, which is that we have the wind turbine and we have a 20 year electrical purchase agreement with um, wind energy development. So, to try to, to bring another source of uh, energy into the district could be legally a, a very tricky situation given that contract. So basically we have to pay through the nose. All right, okay, I won't go further, all right. Okay, um, thank you for that update. Um, prior to adjournment, I'd just like to note that we have an upcoming meeting on January 19th. Um, at that meeting, we will need to be um, uh, confirming our legislative priorities. Um, so um, uh, if you have any more thoughts on that, um, please be sure to, to forward them over. Um, and then on January 25th, we have one of our, I guess, three joint meetings with the town council. Um, and this is just uh, for our end talking about those legislative priorities. So I, I guess I would ask, you know, the HR staff, special ed, you know, if there are anything that, that you all see that the committee should be asking our legislators to do, please let us know. And uh, also, obviously, um, um, committee members, and uh, we'll, we'll inquire to see what all REASC is doing. We took an initial stab at this, um, so we have some ideas, but you know, we may have more developments now. So um, that's the big one there. Okay, um, with that, can I have a motion to adjourn, please? So moved, but happy uh, happy holidays. Yeah, and second on all of it. Uh, we have a motion uh, to adjourn with happy holidays and seconded. Uh, call on the vote. Mr. Ferber. Aye. Mrs. McDade. Aye. Ms. Mr. Vadney. Aye. Mr. Shears. Ho, ho. Ho, ho. Uh, uh, Mr. <laughs> Pinero. Scrooge, that's pretty good. Aye. Uh, Ms. Kelly. Aye. Uh, Emily Copeland. Aye. All right. Happy holidays to everybody. Thank you. Uh, thanks to the high school. And we'll see you all in a couple of weeks. Stay safe and healthy. Bye -bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.